Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We will discuss the use of 3D cell culture technologies in drug development, and we will talk about why these systems are superior to the cell culture methods that have been really used since 1950s and why we really should be changing how uh, drug development models and screening tools are done in order to get a uh, more predictive ability, more, more higher predictive value of our preclinical and early screening methods. So the objectives for today are to establish the really importance of incorporating not just any kind of microenvironment into the model systems, but specifically organ-specific and human tissue microenvironment in any of the models that are used for testing of drug efficacy and safety. We'll also demonstrate the versatility of z 3D culture models in their design and uh, evaluation of response to various anti-cancer agents. And I would also like to share some very exciting clinical study data that we have recently obtained that demonstrates the high correlation of our reconstructed bone system with clinical response. So the two key questions in drug development and finding successful treatments for cancer is one, what makes a successful cancer drug? What characteristics does the compound have to have to really be successful? And question two, which we're gonna spend most of the time of today, is how do we find these compounds? How do I, we identify the drug candidates that will actually be effective in patients? So let's start with question one. What makes a successful anti-cancer drug? And the two main characteristics of a successful anti-cancer drug is one, this compound has to eliminate the tumor, and two, it cannot damage the organism. So one, we have to get rid of cancer, and two, we have to really have compounds that are not going to affect the person. Great, so how do we find these compounds? What models do we need to use to really identify such agents? And the idea behind 3D culture systems that are becoming more and more prominent came from as early as 1960s when Dr. Smithers suggested that cancer is really not a disease of a single cell and that it is a disease really of cellular organization and cellular interactions. So we really have to look beyond the single cell to the tissues that are comprised of various cells with a very specific architecture to the organ itself where all of the tissues come together and join into a single unit and of course the organism that is comprised of all these organs. So all of this works together and all of the different systems contribute to cancer development and progression. So what cues in the microenvironment are critical for drug development and for identifying successful treatments? So interactions between cells and the extracellular matrix in the tissue environment are critical as such interactions can provide protection against various drugs. Cell-cell interactions are really important where cells interact between, so they have a tumor-tumor interactions between various uh, components within the tumor or interactions between tumors and the stroma. Physical and chemical factors play a role in driving cancer development and affect drug response. And of course, systemic factors such as cytokines, chemokines have very uh, drastic effects on tumor behavior. So any kind of system that would be useful for testing anti-cancer drugs have to really take into account multitude of these components. So when we look at an ideal clinical candidate, such a compound is a drug that can overcome the environment-mediated drug resistance, and such resistance is driven by multiple components within the tissue microenvironment, such as the extracellular matrix, tumor-tumor interactions, meaning interactions between tumor cells that comprise the tumor, and various stromal elements that are found within that microenvironment, such as secreted factors, so cytokines, chemokines, things like that, 
different stromal cells, fibroblasts, uh, various components of uh, different tissues, and immune um, elements that often uh, offer protection again against uh, anti-cancer drugs. And it's being more and more recognized now that the currently used models of cancer really in large part don't work. And that we really need systems that will capture cellular organization and will reconstruct the architecture of the tissue itself, placing the tumor cell in the context of its host and providing physiological relevance to the whole system. The currently used methods and the standard cell culture methods largely rely on placing cells on a flat surface of a tissue culture plate. However, tissues are not flat, so we cannot continue using such methods. Here are some examples of brain cells, liver, vasculature, so endothelial cells, colon, muscle, all of these different cells from different tissues cultured in standard systems. And as you can see, even though there are slight differences in the shape of the cell, they're all flat, they're all growing in a monolayer. This does not in any way represent what happens in the tissue where the cells are organized with other cells into very specific and distinct architecture depending on the tissue type. So in order to get the correct drug response from the new compounds that we're looking at, we really have to set up a system that will mimic the, the tissue of interest. There are a number of different 3D culture technologies that are now emerging, and they're becoming more and more sophisticated, and combining different methods is really what's going to get us closer and closer to true physiological relevance. I'm going to touch on a few systems here. This is not, by no means an exclusive list, but just to give you a flavor of what, uh, what's available. So there are some spheroid systems where cells are grown in either as a hanging drop or in a non-adherent um, system in uh, round bottom plates forming a spheroid. This does mimic tumor mass, but such systems lack human environment, they lack 3D environment, and really do not reconstruct functional tissue. Therefore, the drug response is not going to be correct and it will be skewed um, away from true physiological relevance. There are various scaffolds that are being developed now, inert, active hydrogels, where really cells are embedded into this matrix mimicking the 3D environment, and these systems provide extracellular matrix support, but unfortunately these are not human-specific systems. So in most cases, they lack the human environment. And because these are essentially one size fits all, a single type of extracellular matrix that is used for mimicking different organs, it's not organ specific and therefore does not really allow reconstruction of a functional tissue that does not mimic the um, drug response and drug behavior. Tumor explants are scaffold-free patient-derived systems where you take a piece of a tumor, mince it and culture it in standard growth medium with potentially some supplements added. And such systems do provide direct insight to analysis capacity, but they cannot, the cells cannot really survive long-term without the exogenous 3D environment and without adding exogenous extracellular matrix and therefore the utility to mimic drug response is limited to a short window of time before the cells start dying off. Bioprinting have very similar limitations, does allow very high spatial precision of recreating a tissue, but again, because of the lack of human environment, the cells cannot survive long term, again, limiting clinical utility and predictive capacity. Organ on the chip technologies, the really interesting aspects of those systems is the ability to, one, put multiple types of tissues into one system and having dynamic perfusion, therefore 
allowing for dynamic interaction and dynamic stimuli to be evaluated in the system. But again, the problems arise when, because these models still lack human microenvironment and they have limited capacity to predict clinical response. Now, what I'm going to tell you about our systems, we can actually use some of our technology together with tumor explants and with bioprinting methods and organ and the chip methods and by combining our extracellular matrix and organ specific environments we can actually add utility and really as I was saying in kind of combining these models to truly create a physiologically relevant system. So how do we recapitulate the really the complexity of the human tissues? What Zipredicta developed is human organ specific 3D culture method and really it's a set of different systems because they're organ specific so we're developing and validating systems for just different organs and our systems are comprised of organ specific extracellular matrix and disease specific medium supplements and when put together with cells we can set up a one-to-one -one reconstruction of human tissue microenvironment and looking at the extracellular matrix formulations that we have developed, the, these organ-specific matrices really mimic tissue architecture. So what we're looking here at is, right here on the upper left-hand side, is the reconstructed bone environment, and the uh, image shows the cryo-electron microscopy image of cells grown in our reconstructed bone environment. So here you see cell clusters, the cultures were flesh frozen and fractured and then scanning EM was run on them. So you can see here fractured cell clusters embedded in this honeycomb structure of the extracellular matrix. On the right hand side here we're looking at bone marrow sample and we're seeing exactly the same thing in vivo as what we, what our reconstruction did. Again cellular clusters in a very similar honeycomb structure of the extracellular matrix. In contrast, here on the bottom left is the scanning cryo-EM image of collagen 1. And as you can see, it does not really mimic the bone marrow. It's very fibrous when the marrow itself is, has this honeycomb structure with walls between uh, different sectors. So having the correct extracellular matrix provides one, the correct tissue architecture, and two, I'm going to show more uh, data on this in a second, it provides the correct environmental cues for tissue development and survival. Our models can be broken down into a couple of different um, groups. One is single compartment models. And the examples that I'm going to give today is reconstructed bone and reconstructed lung models. And these systems provide the environment for the bone marrow and the lung tissue. And the single compartment models are set up by placing the extracellular matrix mixed with cells into a well of a tissue culture plate. The matrix is polymerized and medium with supplements is added over the matrix. And then the cells are cultured, treated with drugs, and any experiments you want it can be done. Here's an example of our reconstructed bone system as it's used for culture of multiple myeloma. And as some of you may know, multiple myeloma is extremely difficult to culture the primary cells. So the primary cells from patients with multiple myeloma do not survive in plastic, as shown here in the upper right hand side, upper left, I'm sorry. It does not really, these cells don't really survive in straight matrix gel or collagen 1. And all of these were um, grown for 14 days, but the cells really start dying off within a couple of days, and especially in plastic within a day or two, they're um, gone with the exception of some stromal cells. Now, if you place the same primary cells within our reconstructed bone environment, it allows for long-term survival of these cells. These cultures have actually been taken out to 
over 30 days and we can maintain the ability. But what you can see here on the bottom images is that we start with single cells, then these cells kind of migrate around, find their favorite place within the matrix, and then they form clusters. So plasma cells form clusters, B cells form from different clusters, and stroma is also growing out in these cultures. So it's a little hard to see, but there's stromal cells growing out. Um, and we see osteoblasts, osteoclasts, adipocytes growing out in these cultures, really mimicking the physiological um, environment. A big question arises is whether in such a system there is some population drift that occurs with having one cell type overgrowing the other as we see proliferation happening in the system and looking at different cellular populations within our uh, reconstructed bone compared to the ex vivo marrow. So on the left, we're looking at ex vivo. On the right, we're looking at our reconstructed bone marrow. And you can see that really there is no population drift, essentially. What we place into this culture is what we get out from it. And also the proliferation capacity, and this is really what allows us to maintain the culture's culture integrity without any drift, is because the system supports physiological proliferation properties of the cells. So if we're going to look at the middle panel here, this is proliferation of B cells as measured by loss of CFSE fluorescence over time. And you can see that by day five, or rather, sorry, by day three in culture, we already see statistical significance within proliferation of B cells. Plasma cells proliferate quite a bit slower, and statistical significance starts at about day eight. And this really does mimic the physiological properties of these cells, where B cells proliferate rapidly and plasma cells prolifer pro proliferate slowly. Now, the clonal expansion of the myeloma tumor cells is also evident in the system with, within eight days, as shown on the bottom um, right here, within eight days we see statistical significant and expansion of the multiple myeloma tumor cells, and this expansion can be anywhere between two and 10 times depending on a particular patient. So again, the system really does capture the biology of the disease, and right now that was the only platform where we can expand the myeloma clone with consistency. The same thing is true for acute myelogenous leukemia AML primary cells grown in reconstructed bone system. You can see here we get a cellular compartment growing out, we get stromal compartment growing out, shown on the upper right. And then if we zoom in and look at the viability of the cells, you can see that at day 28, the viability of the hematopoietic cells is essentially close to 90%, with green staining showing live cells, red staining showing dead cells. And if we look at uh, as early as day four, actually a little bit earlier than day two, we see majority of the AML cells are dead when cultured in a standard model. We have also looked at primary lung and taking the primary cells from the non-small cell lung cancer patients, culturing them in the reconstructed lung system. We get spheroids of lung epithelium with the stromal compartment growing out as well. You can see here again, all of this is alive all the way until the 33. And we have also started looking at immune infiltrates, and we get both T cells and myeloid cells maintained within the cultures, and these were the cells that were originally present in the tumor. So these were dissociated tumors and then cultured in the system. So we get really in their constructed lung, we clearly can support epithelial compartment, stromal compartment, immune compartment, which becomes critical for any kind of drug testing. Another set of models that we have developed are co-culture systems, so multi-compartment models. In this case, multi-layered systems where we culture epithelium and stroma and immune components, and then looking at drug response. So the system would look as a layered, um, as layered extracellular matrices within, again, a well of cell culture plates. So on the bottom of the well would layer a stromal compartment, and we have many cases of mucosal compartments, so that would be Oh, extracellular matrix uh, mixed with the stromal cells, 
And then there's organ specific extracellular matrix that is mixed with uh, epithelium. And then medium growth medium is added. And what oh, these one, two, and three indicating here oh, is we can add immune cells to the growth medium to mimic the immune cells found in circulation. We, follow, we can follow their um, intravasation into the tissue. We can actually add the immune cells directly into the matrix in this in the epithelial layer, mimicking the resident immune cells. And we can also, from the stromal compartment, we can use cancer-associated fibroblasts, we can use non-malignant stroma, dendritic cells, any, anything that's um, useful, mesenchymal stem cells, so anything that's useful. And then we can add the test agents to the medium, very similar to the single compartment models. And then in this case, we can evaluate the treatment of, um, on the tumor spheroids, on stroma, in the bone marrows that I showed um, a second ago, and I'll show data on that. We can again look at both tumor and non-tumor populations, dissecting out the effects, the on-target and off-target effects. So here's an example of reconstruction of both stromal and epithelial niches. In this case, this was a reconstructed stomach system with the submucosal layer with the cancer-associated fibroblasts layered in the submucosal extracellular matrix, and then the gastric tumor cells in the gastric matrix layered on top with growth medium. And you can see here spheroids forming within the epithelial layer, and then there is a stromal compartment below that. And of course, there's crosstalk between the compartments, so there's some epithelial cells that are actually preferentially growing within the submucosa. These are more invasive cells and some stromal cells infiltrating into the epithelial layer. So again, using these types of systems, you can dissect out the response to drugs within different cellular compartments. And finally, another type of a multi-compartment system that we have created is the reconstructed metastasis model, where we can look at metastasis from multiple different Oh, my apologies, primary tumors to either bone or lung, and this we're expanding these systems. And in this case, we utilize a transwell model where we place the cells in the transwell chamber within the extracellular matrix of one tissue and allow them to migrate to the bottom compartment where there's extracellular matrix of a different tissue. And this way we can um, assess the drug efficacy on two different compartments at the same time. Here's an example of what it looks like. In this case, the input uh, was um, breast cancer cells using three different types of cells, non-malignant, malignant, and metastatic. And non-malignant cells form spheroids within the trans wall in the top compartment. They do not migrate through the membrane. These dark circles are just the membrane pores, and they do not colonize the metastatic niche. Same thing happens with malignant but not metastatic cells. Again, they form these tumor-like structures within the reconstructed breast ma matrix, but do not invade and really do not colonize the reconstructed bone environment on the bottom. But metastatic cells, you can see here, they start coming off the tumor spheroids and they um, invade. So it's a little hard to see here within the um, membrane. You can see there's kind of these lighter gray dots, those are nuclei of the invasive cells, and then there is a very robust colonization of the uh, reconstructed bone matrix. So we can actually fractionate cells this way and utilize this for drug screening, for target discovery, to specifically identify targets on uh, metastatic cells. So now looking at these models for drug development, the, one of the main advantages of the system, aside for multiple applications that, can be, that it can be used for, is its ability to evaluate both efficacy and toxicity in a single assay. So we can look at, for example, bone marrow toxicity. We can look at tumor cells, bone marrow toxicity at the same time. We can look at tumor stromal compartments, things like that. And here is a by no means a comprehensive list of different applications that we can use this system for in terms of drug screening, but some of the main applications are attrition management, really pipeline prioritization, identifying which drugs should move forward, 
Oh, we can use it to rescue some of the failed drug candidates. Perhaps the drug did not work in an animal model, and it's again been fairly widely accepted at this point that animal models of cancer are not truly representative of human disease. So some of the drugs that may not have worked in a mouse, but work in a truly human system, might actually be worth revisiting. Of course, the system can be used for screening, for efficacy testing, looking at combination treatments of various compounds, looking at drug resistance, looking at off-target toxicity and bystander effect, immune oncology applications, because this is a fully human system that incorporates the human immune, immune components and other comp cellular compartments, really looking at immune oncology becomes a lot easier than trying to use a mouse model. can also use the, the system for identifying responders versus non-responders to certain compounds, and of course for targeted bi biomarker discovery, and potentially as a companion diagnostic. So now I'm going to show some examples of the assays that we've done with different compounds and how the system can be utilized. So we've tested various types of uh, various classes of therapeutic agents and the system works with small molecules, both, both synthetic and natural products. It works with large molecules such as antibodies, antibody drug conjugates. We're doing work with bio and tri specifics now and all of these compounds are effective in our system. Also cellular therapies such as CAR-Ts, and I'll show some examples of that. All of these types of agents can be used in such a system. So the data presented here really highlights that the correct microenvironment is crucial to get the correct readout. So here we're looking at a couple of different compounds that either worked or didn't work, and we'll try to understand why they were working or not working. So right here on the upper left-hand side, compound one, this is an FDA-approved drug that has been in the clinic for a number of years now and is known to have high relevance and really high clinical um, utility. So when we tested this compound in a standard 2D culture system, in a system that only had the extracellular matrix but not specific factors or stromal factors, and our reconstructed bone system, this drug really performed well in, uh, under all scenarios, and this was expected. Now, another compound, compound 3, middle upper uh, graph, this was a compound that we looked at, this was a natural product, it again worked well, we, we saw a very good dose response even with adding all of the elements of drug resistance that present in the reconstructed bone, which is the red line. And this compound was also quite effective uh, throughout. And it did end up advancing to clinical trials and is actually performing quite well. Compound 5 also worked well, even though you can see here there is some resistance that is noticeable in the lower doses, you can see the red line under the reconstructed bone conditions, but uh, later on the, it still shows a very strong dose response and it was advanced to in vivo studies. Compound 2, bottom left uh, graph, was an interesting case. This was a compound that was actually already in the clinic when we started working on it. And as you can see, by adding different elements of the microenvironment, the extracellular matrix where the blue line is, and the full system, full reconstructed bone system with stromal components, by adding these elements, the, really the response uh, to this drug was drastically reduced. And by using, looking at the reconstructed bone, we actually taken the concentration all the way into micromolar range, and we never saw any effect about 70% was the best we could do in terms of cell kill. And we later dissected out what was causing the resistance here, and we found out that it was because of the tumor stroma interactions. So the system is really useful to identify if there is some resistance that is known or noticed, and really figuring out where is it coming from and potentially identifying useful combinations to overcome this, this resistance. And then compound four was an interesting case. It had 
Very similar active site to compound 3, but interaction with stroma and addition of stromal components in our bone system completely knocked it out, its activity. And this particular compound was actually abandoned. So the system can be also utilized for attrition management, as I was saying, in pipeline prioritization. So here we're looking at 10 different compounds, seven single agents and three combination treatments. And looking at the dose response, we can see here that the viability goes down with different compounds. And you can look at and say, really identify compounds that are working better or worse and prioritize your pipeline really accordingly because you're really looking now at the physiological system. You can also look at therapeutic window like compound four where you have kind of decrease here, fairly drastic, and then again leveling off. So there might be a good therapeutic window to look at for this particular compound. Looking deeper into the combination treatment, we can also identify useful versus deleterious combinations. And without going into a lot of details of the study, what I want you to look at is here, the combination of the Aurora kinase inhibitor BI2536 with dexamethasone in the reconstructed bone system, showed an effect in reducing the tumor cell population. However, the combination of the same Aurora kinase inhibitor with bortezomib actually induced tumor cell growth, and this has been validated in other studies as well. But our system was uh, the first to capture this effect, and it would be a very easy and quick way to screen out combinations that either don't work or are deleterious. Another example of the utility of the platform and 3D cultures is the capacity to look at both efficacy and toxicity because of the capability of the system to incorporate various cellular compartments. So we're not just looking at a single tumor cell or a set of tumor cells, we're really looking at the whole tissue. So in this example, again, we're looking here at bortezomib and we're looking at the bone marrow cultures, the reconstructed bone cultures for multiple myeloma. And looking at bortezomib at day seven, you can see a dose response against the tumor cells, but no effect on non-tumor cell population with the increased dose. And this is great. This is really kind of going back to the first characteristic of a good anti-cancer drug. It kills the cancer cells, but not the non-malignant cells. And this can be done over and over again with any compound can look at responders and non-responders. In this case, we looked at patients who were treatment naive, treated with pomalidomide. You can see a dose response effect on the blue line or patients who are refractory to pomalidomide. And you can see that they were really not responding and you can really identify and fractionate patient populations based on who's responding, who's non-responding and then use um, this type of assays as potentially companion diagnostics. We can also identify the bystander effect within the systems. This is where the multi-compartment uh, multi system becomes useful. Here we looked at gastric cancer and breast cancer and looking at uh, treatment of the culture with vehicle or this antibody drug conjugate that we're studying. We saw the decrease in the activated stroma markers like smooth muscle actin, parasite markers, and an increase in um, stromal remodeling towards non-malignant stroma away from cancer-associated stroma with an increase in adipocyte markers and some of the increases in endothelial markers. So again, we can follow this type of response and identify compounds that would help normalize the stromal environment, which then can drive also and assist in anti-tumor effects of potential combination treatment. And finally, looking at some of the uh, cellular therapies, as I mentioned, our system works well with CAR T cells. And in this case, we had tumor spheroids that were cultured and CAR T cells. Here you can see on the images, these individual cells, green is again live, red is dead. So tumor spheroids treated with more CAR T cells survive beautifully over time, but Tumor spheroids treated with target-specific CAR T cells, as shown on the image on the right, 
as you can see, becoming red and they're dying off. We see activation of the target-specific CAR T cells and we see increased uh, cell death within the population treated with target-specific CAR T cells. And then finally, as uh, just some of the data that I wanted to share that was acquired fairly recently, we're looking at the correlation of the treatment response that we see in our culture with what's seen in the clinic. And the way the study is set up is we take a biopsy sample, we then fractionate the sample, some as goes for clinical diagnostics and the decision-making for clinical treatment, and then some goes into our platform. Once the clinical treatment, this is step two, is ident identified, we also treat the cells in our lab with the same compounds. And then in the end, we compare the clinical outcome observed by the, clin by the physician with what we see in culture. So we're looking at whether patient responded or was resistant to treatment, and we're looking of whether the cells were sensitive or, or resistant to treatment. And here is a couple of examples of the multiple myeloma study that we have running. Looking at various patients and responses, we can see, for example, um, in the patient who had progressive disease, in our system, we did not see any effect of treatment. Patient that was in partial remission, the blue line, you could see a dose-response effect reaching 50%, but it's not a complete response. And then the patient who was in a very good partial remission, we could see a very drastic drop in viability and then a plateau. Again, showing that this patient responded quite well, but this is not a complete remission. And so far, we've been able to predict 19 out of 21 cases correctly compared to the current failure rate overall of drug development where 19 out of 20 drugs fail because of lack of efficacy in patients. So this, this system is really useful for wide variety of um, applications for drug development. So I hope that I was able to provide some key answers to the initial questions posed. So the question one that we had was, what makes a successful uh, anti-cancer drug? And that was fairly simple. We want something with high anti-tumor activity and no off-target effect. Easier, easier said than done. How do we find these types of drugs? Well, we have to utilize really physiologically relevant methods, in this case, organ-specific models, during both target discovery and testing phases of drug development. So essentially, we really have to start shifting away from uh, open screens and in 2D models to more targeted uh, drug development in physiologically relevant systems. And we'll be happy to answer questions. Please feel free to also email us with any questions. And I will stop with that and really take um, whatever questions that you have right now. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and would love to hear from everybody. Thank you.